Oh, you're a quick with that cat. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Captain Marie Knafels. I call her Dr. Knafels. She is a MD, PhD. God, you ever do anything with that? <laughs> Goof around. <laughs> Dr. Knafels is the medical director of the Naval Experimental Diving Unit where she's been working since about 1985. She received her uh, MD at Temple University School of Medicine, later received her PhD in Health and Human Performance at the University of Florida. <coughs> Dr. Knafel's research has included evaluations of breathing performance and life support capabilities of UBAs, as well as research related to exercise, respiratory and auditory stresses during diving. She's uh, some 27 publications, to name a few, on diving-related issues. Dr. Knafels has been an extremely valued member of the NAWI Rebreather Advisory Board. I mean, we've got advisory boards, but let's real, be, be real. Some of them respond, <coughs> some of them are asleep. Dr. Knafels was not asleep. She gave valued information. We took it and we used it. Please welcome Dr. Knafels. <laughs> I must say, I might sleep today, okay? <laughs> First and foremost, anybody and anything can get in the water and die. As my Chesapeake Bay Retriever aptly demonstrates, that if you see something, you go for it. Not much intelligence, but I have to be impressed with this superior glottal control of <laughs> eyes wide open, mouth ready to <laughs> grasp something, uh, totally control the situation. Doesn't have to know anything except go for it. And what I'm hoping to do with this lecture is to make you smarter than the average Chesapeake. <laughs> <laughs> Might be tough, understood, because I realize similarities in that Chesapeake's, the biggest problem with Chesapeake's is they don't like getting out of the water. So I'm sure there's people over here too who prefer to spend the time in the water as well. For simplicity's sake, and because of time constraints, I might not be able to talk as fast as you, is that I will summarize the body is made of three systems. The neurological system, the cardiovascular system, and the respiratory system. So let's talk about the neurological system. And for all intents and purposes, there's only a couple things that occur with the neurological system. <coughs> Everyone probably experiences the fact that you go below 100 feet, you have the effect of nitrogen or coasts. Why does this fat-soluble mo molecule do anything to you? We don't really fully understand. Except somehow it inhibits the transfer of signals from nerves to nerves, just like anesthetic gas. Probably the biggest problem you have with nitrogen narcosis is that if you dive deep often enough, you don't suffer the effects. And that is one of the biggest fallacies that get people into trouble, because you do not adapt to nitrogen narcosis. Nitrogen narcosis is very interesting in that it affects mental ability. Doing physical tasks and doing actual work, somehow that remains okay. That's one of the reasons why, at least in the Navy, and I would hope you would do too if you have a doing underwater work, as you do the job over, over, over again so that it's rote memory. You can go on automatic as soon as you get to the job, you can do it because you know what you're supposed to do. Because that function remains intact. If you have to think of trying to correct the problem, if things go sideways, that mental impairment still exists. So the problem with nitrogen narcosis is the diver feeling very complacent. I have dove this dive so many times, I'll be okay. It's a narcotic effect, but in in reality, in reality, you probably get more of a mental impairment with physical exercise than you do even with 5% CO2. However, when you add CO2 at low levels, say up to 2 
with nitrogen narcosis, they add together and cause a lot more trouble than you would have by just increasing the two load. Oxygen toxicity is another thing that mostly is people think about the central nervous system, but I'll also mention it can also affect the pulmonary system. Gotta go back to my notes. Like I said, three hours is kind of mental deficiency time. Pulmonary oxygen toxicity. Now, I think Dr. Lamberton is the best way of looking at oxygen toxicity in general. It's not toxicity, it's poison. It's called for what it's worth. <coughs> Just like any drug, oxygen is a drug. It has a dose response curve. <coughs> and if you look at dose response curve, it's essentially what this is just trying to demonstrate. You give higher doses, you're going to have more of an effect. Lesser doses, you still get an effect, but it takes time to see those effects. That's why you get away with diving with oxygen, because the <coughs> times of effect, you can get away with it. You can do it without it affecting you immediately. That's, that's the key, not getting away. You can get away with it because the effect is not immediate. What's happening? Oxygen, just by pure metabolism, in order to make energy within your body, you have the production of what we call oxygen-free radicals. You probably hear about adipose oxidants, you know, vitamin D e and all this other good stuff. Oxygen-free radicals are very destructive molecules, and because of that, and they are the natural occurring things of metabolism, your body does have defense mechanisms to take care of them. Uh, superoxide dismutase is one of the sod, a very interesting phenomenon. Hyperbaric exposures actually, like during a treatment, actually upregulate, and you actually have more production of sod to take care of all these oxygen free radicals that are floating around in your body due to the exposure. But what happens with oxygen poisoning is there becomes a time when you're stripping out your defenses. Now, why does some part of the body are affected than other parts of the body is very simple. Every cell in your body is different. So that's why some parts of the body are affected more immediately than others. With pulmonary oxygen toxicity, the problem with technical diving that can occur that you have to be aware of is cumulative diving at high partial pressures of oxygen will have a cumulative effect. Most often you hear folks talk about uh, changes in vital capacity, but you also can get changes in the diffusion capacity, the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the system. I will tell you from the years, literally years, of experiments we've been doing for accelerated uh, decompression using oxygen and various decompression tables we've been developing at the unit, People complaining of symptoms are probably the more important thing you should take thought of and concern about than any clinical test to do. So if you are diving, and because you're different from you as far as your response to oxygen, is that if someone's saying, I have substernal burning, I take a deep breath and my chest feels a little tight, you need to hold off on diving for a while. Let the lungs recover. It might take two, three days. One fella in our unit took 30 days before he recovered from the pulmonary oxygen dose. Everyone's different. And unfortunately, we have no way to predict who's going to respond to what and how you're going to re recover from it. To leave having the free radicals to go ahead and inhibit the neurotransmitters. Usually GABA is often implicated in that. And things go horrible. It's a grand mal seizure. The concern is, how we've all heard of convulsions on water are deadly, obvious. I'll try to avoid it. I will tell you that if you dive 1.6, your chances of, a, of an oxygen convulsion is probably a moderate risk. 1.4, moderate, mild risk. 1.3, you feel 
pretty confident it's not going to be a problem. But there are some things that can weigh the situation one way or the other. And the most often one is considering the effect of exercise, again, CO2. The work that was done at Dr. Lambertson's lab at the University of Pennsylvania really looked at the issue of, again, thinking it as a drug. If you deliver more drug to that area of the body, it will cause more of an effect. CO2 and exercise, increase cerebral blood flow. Hey, guess what? A lot more blood flow, guess what it delivers? You have a lot more oxygen dissolved in the plasma. You have more oxygen on site. Gee, metabolism, oxygen-free radicals. Cascade goes on and on. With that in mind, Think of it this way, if you're still thinking oxygen as a drug and it has effect because you're, this thing's rolling along, if you stop the oxygen or lower the partial pressure, what do you have to do? You have to wait till your body scavenges up all those other oxygen-free radicals. That doesn't happen instantaneously either. So that's a phenomenon that we call off-O2 effect. I will reiterate, the symptomatology of, of an oxygen symptoms, CNS oxygen hit, twitching, dizziness, nausea, constellation it is not a progression of symptoms at all. You can get one, you can get the other, you can get all, you can get none, just have a convulsion. Most often when you talk about diving bradycardia, the lowering of the heart rate with diving, is really most often associated with breath hole diving. You have changes in the ECG and you have all this and that and the other thing. You know, and as you can see, I'm not making a big deal about it because clinically it's not a big deal about it anyway. But really, what happens with diving? Now, not everyone might be able to read this, but essentially what this is, is uh, four curves. The first one is a dive, a one at, dive one atmospheric air. Then you go down four atmospheres air, and then you bring the scuba rig. And you notice there's no significant difference with the different uh, workloads that are being done. So diving bradycardia is really phenomenal breath hole diving from the literature that I've been able to find. Uh, it says it really has no great impact on you. Even if you add, uh, in this series, the people who had it, uh, the solid dots are, are air, the square is uh, two atmosphere and air, and then, then the triangle is two atmospheres with oxygen. And again, there's really no significant difference in heart rate, even if you add oxygen. See, why do I even say that? Well, I'm trying to be complete here. We I mean, always so when you stick them inside the bathtub, is they pee right away. You probably have experience jumping in the water. Okay, we'll call it diuresis, you know. Uh, but why? Standing here, my whole cardiovascular system is working against gravity. I have a nice gradient. In the water now, that gradient goes away. So where does the blood go? Well, it just kind of flows everywhere it wants to, and it likes to go here, into the central area, the largest area that you can fill up. Now, that does have a significant effect on you. You said diuresis. Well, what, why would you pee when you jump in the water? Well. You have cardiac stretch receptors, and you talk about the baroreflex, and, uh, and it, it stops uh, antidiuretic hormone from releasing and all this stuff. But, well, that might be part of the story, but studies for that giving people antidiuretic hormone, you call it anti-peeing hormone, uh, doesn't really solve the issue here. 
What it does to you, though, when you urinate in the water, other than when you're cold and you're in your wetsuit and you're really cold and you want to get warm quick, uh, you end up losing a lot of uh, volume. So you can get chemo concentration. Probably the other big factor that occurs is that all this blood engorging the central system. Now, what does that do to your heart? Well, we have a term called preload, which means if you have a bunch of blood sitting inside that comes back into the return side of the heart, you have all this fluid that has to be pushed out. <coughs> That's preloading the heart, which means now the heart has to contract harder, has a hard, bigger stroke volume, and as a result, a larger cardiac output. Why is that important to you? Well, if you have someone, and I do get calls to the unit from people who've had heart attacks wanting to die. This is a strain on the heart. The heart's going to have to work. They really need to assess their ventricular function before they go diving. It's not, it's not a simple matter. For most of the folks here, it really doesn't fill a bean. But those, if you're out there with people who are asking to do something, you better really know what their, their physical state is. Granted, that does not happen very frequently at all in diving. It has been associated with free split meters as well. So it's not just some, it's something I bring to you because it's the symptoms of difficulty breathing, constriction, can't get the breath while they're at the bottom, before they ascend. Differential diagnosis of pulmonary symptomatology. So pulmonary edema is, is a real event. Think about it, what can you do about, just like everything, give them oxygen, get them to the hospital, figure it out later. You can also shut down or reduce the level of red blood cells that your body can produce, because why do I need to? Your body's kind of lazy. Diver, ah, oh, forget it. But it's poor completeness. In case someone asks you about it. You know how some students are, they always like to read a little tidbit and see if they can catch you. Civilian students are just like baby students. You don't tell me they're not. Ah, subject I'm a little bit more familiar with is uh, the rest. Uh, I like to think of as the ventilatory system because really the only aspects that we're concerned about is ventilation, getting the gases in and out. And there's several loads that everyone is exposed to. Uh, well, those who go open circuit are probably not exposed to elastic loads. If you are diving semi-closed and uh, closed circuits, you will have the elastic load as well. So let's talk about some of these. Hydrostatic load. The easiest way to look at hydrostatic load is the way uh, Dr. Lundgren has, has uh, presented it as. It is the difference between the breathing gas source and the lung pressure centroid. Gee, that's a mouthful. Yeah, you know, it's that theoretical area somewhere here, 13 centimeters down, seven centimeters back. A hypothetical place where all the pressures within your lungs are zero. So as a result, on the surface, breathing gas source here, lung pressure centroid, you have to pull that gas down because this is a higher pressure. You have to pull it down. It's a negative pressure. Scuba regulator. Get under the water. You still have, here's your breathing gas source. The tank's on your back. The breathing gas source is right here. You have this hydrostatic load you're pulling against. If you're diving a rebreather, or like a Drager R5 that you probably see around these halls here, <coughs> breathing gas source is here, or negative breathing, or or with your scuba really, you tear it head down position. Now this is a higher <coughs> pressure than your lungs, so now it's positive. So static load is always there in any type of breathing apparatus. So the big problem with hydrostatic loads is you don't like them. Well, not completely. 
like I said, a negative load you find, as it says, hard to inhale, positive, hard to exhale. Just think about the pre pressure difference. Higher pressure, less, harder, because you've got to suck. Okay. Well, how much pressure can you get away with? Well, Dr. Thoman and, uh, and company went up to the University of uh, New York at Buffalo, and they have what they call the Buffalo Wall, and, and basically they, they looked at ranges of negative 20 centimeters of water. We're not talking big pressure here, guys. A centimeters of water, up to about 30, plus 30 centimeters of water. And they found that really people kind of like that little bit. Whether, whether or not he consciously was controlling his breathing pattern, I couldn't say. He doesn't really remember. But there are some people who will not compensate for CO2. And those are the people that run into problems. And there's no way to, to uh, fully predict other than going to a laboratory. They, they, there's some studies you can do to see if somebody is responsive to CO2 or not. Quite frankly, I don't think anyone here probably ought to go through the evolution to see if they're qualified to die. If they're smart. They just, I mean, that's the reason why I'm giving this lecture. To try to give you some ideas of what's going on in your body so you don't put yourself in harm's way. Recognize what you have to do and do it. What do I have to Again, what I've been harping on the fact is CO2 built up in the body. It's open circuit scuba with a semi-close. Close. You will CO2, though a ventilatory driver of respiration on the surface, does not drive ventilation at depth because your respiratory, I should say, your ventilatory system is lazy. Nitrogen narcosis, this confounds the whole issue because now you're happy about it. Okay, let's take a uh, seven minute break.